Sorry, so I multitask on all these and I always forget to record. But that's why I have Mitch Dax from Los Angeles to remind me to do these things. So uh, that's a really good thing. So I want to tell you a little bit about Tamir and then I'm going to spotlight him and then the rest of the program will be his. And, and by the way, uh, Tamir, um, one of our past international presidents, Alan Gottesman from the Holy Land of Florida, sends hello because he is good friends with your brother. What is it, Uti? You can talk, Alan. Adi and Malki. Alti and Malti. Adi, A-D-I. There you go. So Tamir is very excited. And Hillel and Mendel. The and Kaila. <laughs> so we're all connected. Um, and we are all connected. Um, and we'll talk about that at the end, how we're all going to be connected in the first week in June at our virtual convention. So, uh, but let's go back to Tamir. So Tamir Goodman, if you weren't aware, was dubbed by Sports Illustrated magazine as the Jewish Jordan. He's a former American Israeli basketball player. And his story basically is he played basketball for the Talmudical Academy of Baltimore and was ranked one of the best high school players in the country with an average of 35.4 points per game. That is better than what David Kravitz did when he was in high school basketball. <laughs> Goodman then moved to Israel. And so, anyway, he, has, uh, he accepted a scholarship from Townsend University. And the fascinating story, and we're going to have him tell you all about it. He was actually recruited to University of Maryland, which was, uh, but because of his conviction to Yiddishkeit and because he was Shomer Shabbos, he didn't go and he turned that down. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, really great story. Um, I'm going to let you let Tamir take over and tell us all about him. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, here is Tamir Goodman. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you so much uh, to everyone who made this possible. And thank you everyone who's here. I'm, I'm honored to spend time with you. And I hope that uh, you have some questions at the end so I'll, I'll be able to get a chance to know you as well. Um, and my name is Tamir Goodman. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland and I fell in love with the game at a very young age. We had a hoop in the backyard and I spent hours shooting. And usually if I made a shot, the ball would stay on our court. And if I missed a shot, the ball would roll to our neighbor's lawn. Their lawn was a little lower than our lawn, and I'd have to go chase the ball from our neighbor's lawn. So one time I missed a shot, I was about nine, 10 years old. And instead of just chasing the ball the way that I was accustomed to, I just stopped on my court on our lawn and I looked at my hands and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if I could show the whole world you could play division one basketball and get a professional contract to play basketball without playing on Shabbos, without playing on Shabbat. That was a little, thought I had in my head at nine, 10 years old. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. And um, <laughs> I was very, very blessed that I, I grew up in an amazing family. And um, not that long after that, I was playing with my brothers and my older brothers and, and they beat me, they were better than me. And we come inside the kitchen and I was crying because I lost. And my brothers looked at my mother and they said, tell Tamir to just take it easy, it's just a game. Why is he crying? He's supposed to, where his older brothers were supposed to beat him. Why is he so upset? And I said, because it's not just a game to me. It means much more than just a game to me. I love the game. And my parents, my father, Al Shalom, and my mother, they, they, they took it seriously. They knew that it really meant more than, than just a game to me. And they gave me all the support I needed. I was also very lucky that there was a tremendous Jewish coach by the name of Harold Katz, Chaim Katz, who lived near us. So I, um, he worked with my older brother, trained my older brother, and I decided I would start jogging in front of his house and hopefully he'd notice me and come outside and teach me some, some tips. So that's how uh, he started training me. And we worked very hard uh, together all the way up until age 16. And when I was 16 years old, I got invited to my first invitational camp to play against uh, the best players in America and also play in front of college coaches who would hopefully recruit me. Now, this camp was one week long. It was during the summer. It was uh, before Tisha B'Av, during the nine days in the summer when we mourn the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. We don't eat meat, uh, you know, and we, we don't listen to music. It's a very sad time of year for the Jewish people. So before I went to the camp, my mother said to me, you know, make sure you go there as a proud Jew. 
make sure you keep kosher and, and make sure you don't listen to music. It's not the right time to listen to music and Hashem will take care of you. So I got to camp and I'm only six foot three. I have a big yarmulke on with long tzitzis and a cooler of kosher food that my parents pack for me. So this kid taps me on the shoulder at the registration. I turn around, I look up, he's about seven feet tall. He says, hey kid, don't you know this is an invitational camp for the best players in the country? What are you doing here? And I had my little flyer, that my little invitation that they invited me to, I had it in my pocket, but he saw me with my yarmulke. He never thought I, you know, I'd be a good player. So I said, yeah, I've been invited to be here as well. And um, I, I settled in, the camp was only one week long. And I noticed very quickly that the coaches had no interest in me. They were only scouting the other players and they, they wouldn't give me a shot based on how I looked. So uh, Sunday, I played really hard. Not one coach had any interaction with me. Same thing on Monday, same thing on Tuesday. So by Tuesday afternoon, I started to get a little bit nervous because, you know, I'm going to go back to Maryland and I'm not going to have a scholarship. You know, camp's almost halfway done. <laughs> So I asked Hashem for a bracha. I said, Hashem, can you help me? I want to show the Jewish people that Jewish people can play. I want to show these guys that Jewish people can play basketball too, but none of the coaches are coming to watch me play. They're only watching the other players. I'm never going to get a scholarship like this. And Hashem sent me a bracha that night that changed my life, Tuesday night of that camp. I, um, after my little prayer, I go over to my coach. I say, coach, which one of the 15 courts are we playing on tonight? There's 15 courts at this camp outdoors. And every night the coaches would go look at the, players that they were recruiting depending on what court they were on and the coaches actually were playing indoors tonight we're not, not playing on one of the 15 outdoor courts we're playing inside the gym it's a rare opportunity so I grab my sneakers and I go inside the gym and the game starts and all of a sudden in the first quarter I start seeing NC State, Wake Forest, Duke, North Carolina all the famous coaches that I recognize from TV are walking into the gym my coach calls a timeout and he says listen I just got word it started raining outside. So every game in this camp, okay, all the 500 top players in America, all the top Division I coaches, everyone's coming into the gym tonight because it's the only game that's still going on because of the rain. So 15 minutes after my prayer, the entire uh, basketball world is, is now watching me play the one time a week that I'm supposed to play inside the gym. So the game starts after the timeout. This kid comes down. He stops at the foul line. He shoots. He jumps. He misses. I jump up, I grab the rebound, I'm leading uh, a fast break to the other end of the court. I take one dribble and I notice that my teammate is all the way open on the other end of the court. So instead of taking one dribble and throwing him a chest pass or a baseball pass, I don't know what I was thinking. I took one dribble and I threw the ball behind my back from one end of the court all the way to the other end of the court. And my teammate catches it and he dunks it in and the place goes crazy. That pass changed my life forever. Did you see what that Jewish kid just did? What an amazing pass. And that was the first time they looked at me as a division one prospect instead of somebody that was lost basically. And thank God my talent came out more and more. Uh, Wednesday I played really well. Thursday I played really well. And Friday morning I'm playing on one of the outdoor courts. I already have seven division one offers by that point. And the owner of the camp, the owner of the camp starts running down. He says, listen, Tamir, you came here, you were a curiosity, but I'm here to invite you to play in the All-Star game tomorrow on TNT, on national TV, as one of the top players in the camp. I said, I'm 16. I said, Coach, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm Jewish. I don't play on Shabbos. I can't play in the All-Star game. I actually made arrangements for my coach to pick me up and drive me back before Shabbos. And as I'm telling him all this, he thinks I'm crazy. He says, I'm telling you, you're going to play on national TV tomorrow night. I said, I can't. Coach Katz pulls up in his car. Uh, he had a really unique car. <laughs> I'll never forget. He didn't have the outer circle of the steering wheel in his car. He only had the inner piece. So he pulls up, you know, with the, with the inner piece. And he says, I'm here to pick the kid up. I promised that his parents, I'd, I'd bring him home before Shabbos. And my coach drove me back to Maryland. And as we were driving back to Maryland, it hit me for the first time in my life that, you know, my mom was right. You try to be there as a proud Jew. Hashem's going to take care of you. There's going to be a lot of challenges. It's going to be anti-Semitism, but you're going to be all right. And that gave me a lot of confidence going into 11th grade. In 11th grade, I went back to the Samuelical Academy. I was averaging almost 40 points a game. I was ranked the 25th best high school player in the country. And I started getting a lot of scholarship offers in the mail. And then one day, the University of Maryland called the yeshiva. I was playing for all boys yeshiva, only 60 kids in the whole school. 
no one's ever gone on to play college basketball. And here's the University of Maryland calling up. And at the time, they had probably the best team in the country. So they called up Coach Katz. They said, we heard about the Jewish kid. We're coming to watch him play. After one game, the University of Maryland offered me a four-year full athletic scholarship to join the number one team in the country. And I said to uh, my coach, I said, let's, let's agree. Why would we want to wait anywhere else? I'd like being close to home. I love the University of Maryland. They're my favorite team. Let's commit. University of Maryland tells me we love you so much. You already have a scholarship if you want it, but we're coming back just to watch you play tomorrow as a tournament. Thanksgiving tournament. We had another game the next day. He says, you already have a scholarship, but we just enjoy watching you play. We're going to come back tomorrow. And they came back the next day too. And I agreed. I gave him oral commitment. I said, I'm going to play at Maryland on one condition. I can't play on Shabbos. And originally they said they'd do everything they could to accommodate me. And my life changed overnight. I had 700 unique media requests that week. ABC, NBC, CBS, Jerry Seinfeld did a full skit about me on Saturday Night Live. Howard Stern called my house, but my parents didn't let me talk to him. And, um, you know, things changed very quickly. Then, um, uh, you, then the Sports Illustrated calls up and they said they want to do an article about me. They come watch me play. They're so impressed. They said they're going to put a four page article about me in Sports Illustrated. So they sent an NBA photographer to my house and I'm shooting around in the backyard where this whole story began. <laughs> but now I'm there with Sports Illustrated. And he asked me to dunk and he asked me to shoot and I, I'm doing everything. And then I stopped him and I said, you know what? I know that millions of people are about to get this magazine. It's the preview to the Super Bowl edition. This whole media attention, this isn't about me. This is about Israel. And this is about the Jewish people. And I want to represent that. So he said, how can you do that? It was the afternoon. I said, please come to my room. We went back in the house. And I don't know why, but I took out my tefillin. And I put my tefillin back on. And I took out my sitter and my prayer book. And I said, well, this is how Jewish people pray in the morning. So the NBA photographer, he wasn't Jewish, takes a picture. He puts, that's the picture that he put in Sports Illustrated with my tefillin on. The Jewish Michael Jordan with the tefillin on was the first person to be in Sports Illustrated with my tefillin on. And so today, everywhere I go, people stop me on the road and they say, are you the Jewish Jordan? I remember your picture with the tefillin in Sports Illustrated. So seemingly my life was great. I was in Sports Illustrated, best yeshiva, best shul, best family, best friends. And I'm going to play in Maryland. Everything's perfect, right? But towards the end of 11th grade, two huge challenges came my way. Number one, the Jewish school that a yeshiva that I went to, they asked me to transfer for my senior year. Because the media was such a distraction, the school couldn't function. You have paparazzi hanging out the windows. Our gym could only fit 200 people. There's 3,000 people lined up trying to come into the gym. They said, Tamir, you got to find a new school for my senior year. So I couldn't find a school. Where was I going to go? Yeah, it was a very hard challenge. The second challenge was the University of Maryland invited me to start playing there. And I'm playing every night. And then they call me into the office and they say, hey, look, it's almost time for you to play at Maryland. You can stay. You have a scholarship. But we decided, based on how we see things moving forward, how we project you, if you stay and play, you're going to have to play on Saturday. And I said, Coach, thank you so much for the opportunity. I love the team. I love the program. But for Jewish people, Shabbos is more important than basketball. I'm sorry. Gave him back the scholarship. No hard feelings. And now I'm left with no senior year of high school and no scholarship. And all the other teams that were recruiting me filled in their roster. So I just had Shabbos. But I knew that that was the right decision. I knew that Shabbos was above all. So first, where was I going to graduate high school? I couldn't find a school that would accommodate me until I got a phone call from a Christian priest. And the Christian priest told me, I read about you in the paper. I'm the principal of a predominantly African-American Christian school near Baltimore, outside of Washington, D.C. And you can come to my school for a senior year of high school. We have a great team. I said, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm Jewish. What am I going to do in a Christian school? He says, because we have a great team. Our gym seats 5,000 people. We're, we're very accustomed to dealing with the media. And because we're seven-day Adventist Christians, we don't play basketball on Shabbos either. Most Christians are Shabbos is on Sunday. Seven-day Adventists, they celebrate like us. So I said, you know, it sounds like a good idea. So I left the yeshiva and I transferred to a predominantly African-American Christian school in, outside of Washington, D.C. So I get there on the first day of school. There, I'm with my yarmulke and my titsis. There, there, there's a cross hanging. There's prayer before every class. And I, I couldn't understand one thing. Why did Hashem send me to the Christian school? I, I, I just couldn't understand it. The first home game, I'm in warm-ups, I'm in layup lines, and my Jewish coach, Coach Katz, comes in, and I start crying. I have tears in my eyes. I'm supposed to be playing for you in the Jewish school in Yeshiva. What in the world am I doing here? He says, you can't cry now. You got to pick yourself up and go play. 
So I did. I played and I had a good game. And I eventually had a really good season at the Christian school. And at the end of the senior year of high school, I got invited for a very prestigious all-star game. I got a phone call from a representative, hi, uh, from the Michael Jordan uh, Capital Classic All-Star Game. World famous all-star game, been going on for almost 30 years. Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Patrick Ewing, Grant Hill, all the greatest players have played in this game. We're here to invite you to play in the game. I said, wow, that's unbelievable. First Jewish person to get invited to play in this game. I was really excited. So my father, blessed memory, he never missed a game. And he never missed a practice. He loved basketball. We were best friends. But my mother, she was always scared that I was going to get hurt. So she would never watch me play. But I said, Ima, this is the last game of high school. Michael Jordan's supposed to be there. They're sold out. It's in the NBA arena. I could really use my mother. Can you come watch me play one time? So my mother says, all right, I'll come to the game. So the game's about to start. And uh, as we get on the court, the Washington Wizards are coming off the court, the NBA team. And they had an all-star point guard. His name was Rod Strickland. And Rod Strickland comes over to me and says, hey, are you the Jewish kid that I read about in the paper? I said, maybe. Why? He says, good. I bought a ticket. I'm coming to watch you play. So the game's about to start. Rod Strickland's there, sitting at half court. And 17,000 people. And um, I go over to Coach Katz and I said, Coach, my high school coach, you got any last minute pointers here? He says, yeah, don't take any extra dribbles. Don't take any extra dribbles. And he said, by the way, you're Jewish. You have to show akarata tov. You have to show thank you. Go say thank you to Rod Strickland that he came to watch you play and then go out there and don't take any extra dribbles. So that's what I did. I went out there. But my mother, like I said, she didn't know what was going on. So she starts asking my father a million and a half questions about the game. Is he winning? Is he losing? Why is he dribbling? Why is he passing? And my father wanted to concentrate in the game. So he says, listen, I love you, but I, I can't answer all your questions right now. Can you? Let me watch the game. Let me watch the game. So my mother thought, oh, he must not be playing well. So she goes over to the other side of the arena and she goes, my family's there. My siblings, and she goes over to that. Is he playing well? Not playing well. My brother said, listen, Ima, let us watch the game. Who can answer all your questions now? So she thought I wasn't playing well. She takes out her psalms or sefer tilim, and she decides she can't take it. The pressure, she's walking out of the arena. So she starts walking out of the arena and the usher put two and two together. So you might chance, Mrs. Goodman. She says, yeah, why? What did I do wrong? He says, don't go anywhere. Just sit right next to me. Your son's doing great. My mother said, really? Yeah, he's doing great. Stay here. So my mom sat next to him to the end of the game. And at the end of the game, they made an announcement on the loudspeaker. This year's most valuable player just tied Jason Kidd's assist record in assists. And his name is Tamira Goodman. I won the most valuable player against the best players in America with my yarmulke on my head. And that's why Shem sent me to the Christian school. I had to go through the whole roundabout way to be able to do that. But... I didn't have a scholarship to Maryland anymore. Where was I going to play in college? So I get a phone call one day from Towson, Towson University. It's a division one school in Baltimore. And the coach says, look, I'm not Jewish. Nobody on the team is Jewish, but the guys on the team asked me to come recruit you. They read about you in the paper. They read about your religion. They read about the Shabbos. Can we learn more about your religion? I said, sure. Coach comes over to my house with the assistant coach. And my father, blessed memory, comes out uh, of the kitchen with a Jewish Rosh Hashanah calendar the big calendar you get for Rosh Hashanah. And he starts explaining to the coaching staff, the whole Jewish calendar in 15 minutes, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, can't play, can't play, Sukkot, can't play, Sukkot, can't play, Shabbos, can't play. Goes over the, all the holidays. The coach writes the times down and the dates one by one, puts together a proposal and he goes to the head of the conference and says, I got a question. Is there any way you can change the entire schedule for flights TV contracts, hotel reservations, game scheduling for one incoming Jew, and he wants to wear his yarmulke on the court. And the NCAA agreed. They changed the entire schedule for me, and I was able to get a Division I scholarship without having to play on Shabbos or any Jewish holidays. This was impossible. But here I am. It happened. I get on campus. What's the first thing I'm going to do? i got to thank the coach. He changed his schedule. This is unbelievable. I go in there, knock on the door of the office. I say, Coach, hey, you, I'm living out my dream because of you. Thank you. He says, perfect timing. I want you to meet somebody. I say, why? Looks on the other, I look on the other side of his office. I see a guy who barely fit his head into the door, 6'10", 6'11". Coach says, I want you to meet Muhammad. I say, nice to meet you, Muhammad. My coach says, you know, I'm thinking, you guys are both incoming freshmen. You're both on the basketball team. Tamir, you're Jewish. Muhammad, you're a Muslim. I thought you guys would be perfect roommates together. So in two years, I went from all boys yeshiva to graduating from a dominantly African-American Christian school. Now I'm rooming with Muhammad. He tells me his mother's from Lebanon. So... We move in and uh, we have a month of training 
And uh, after a month of training, the first holiday on campus was Sukkis. That was, and out of 17,000 students, there was only one person that was going to sit in a sukkah. It was Friday night in Sukkis. That was me. But there was no Eruv, which means you can't carry. And I had the kosher food and I had the sukkah, but I was stuck. I'm looking out the window. I'm like, I can't carry my food on Friday night into the sukkah across campus. I'm not allowed to carry. There's no Eruv here. So Muhammad sees me looking out the window. He says, why do you keep looking out the window? I say, you see the broken down TP on the other side of campus, that tent? He says, yeah, what is that? I, he's Muslim. I'm explaining. I, listen, I got to eat in that teepee tonight, but I can't carry the food because I'm going through the whole thing. He says, you know what? I'll carry the food for you, Muslim. He starts walking across campus with the gefilte fish and grape juice and challah, and he ducks into the sukkah like this. He can't fit in. He puts the food. I said, Muhammad, you want to eat with me in here? He says, no, this is crazy. And that's how I was able to have sukkahs on campus. Then the season finally starts. Third game of the road, we're in Philadelphia. We're on the road in Philly. And Muhammad and I are just about to fall asleep the night before the game, and I hear a knock on the door at a hotel. I look through the hole, and I see it's our head coach. So we're nervous. We're both freshmen. We know, what does coach want from us? I say to Muhammad, I'll get the door. Just stay in bed. It was late. I open up the door a little bit. Coach says, Mr. Goodman, out in the hallway. I want to talk to you. So I don't know what, what, what did I do wrong. What's going on? Go out to the hallway. He says, listen, I want you to be ready to play tomorrow. I said, I always try to be ready to play. Why? What, what's going on? He says, we're playing against Villanova, one of the best teams in the country. The game is on ESPN live. Millions of people are going to be watching it. And you're starting. You're starting. You're starting five. He says, I just, uh, I just, we just better with you on the court. I said, okay. Close the door. Muhammad said, what was all that about? I said, Muhammad. I'm freaking out. Coach says, I'm starting tomorrow against Villanova. Game's live on ESPN. I'm only 18 years old. They have a senior. I'm a freshman, point guard versus point guard. I, I can't do this. I, I'm too nervous. I, I, I'm not good enough to be on this level. Couldn't sleep the whole night. We get to Villanova two hours before the game, and we're in layup lines. No one is there. It's two hours before the game. It's, no fans are there. But as I'm laying up and I'm so nervous, I'm thinking everybody back home is going to be watching me. <laughs> and... Um, I noticed in the stands at the top, way top of the arena, there's a Jewish lady there. She's the only people there, a Jewish lady with the young Jewish boys wearing a yarmulke. I lock eyes with the, with the Jewish family. And as the young Jewish boy sees me, he takes out a, a poster board. And I'm down on the court, he's all the way up there. And he takes out a permanent marker on his poster board. He's holding it up and he starts writing in Hebrew letters at Villanova. He's spelling out in Hebrew, Bruchim Abayim le Tamir Goodman. He writes in Hebrew, welcome to Tamir Goodman in Hebrew letters. And I said to myself, who ever saw Hebrew letters at Villanova before on an ESPN game? This is unbelievable. And when I saw the letters, I wasn't nervous anymore. It gave me all the confidence. I felt right at home just because I saw Hebrew letters. And I ended up having 13 points and six assists as a freshman. And my coach comes over to me after the game and says, Goodman, you just won the starting spot for the rest of the year as a freshman. You're first a freshman to start in Towson in 11 seasons. And people say to me, how did you start in Division I basketball? I said, it wasn't me. It was the Hebrew letters. So a um, couple games later, we're playing against a team from Boston, and there's a loose ball on the floor. I dive on the loose ball. Somebody from the other team dives on the loose ball, and he slams my head in to the floor, uh, fighting for a rebound, uh, fighting for the loose ball. But when I got up, I noticed that everybody in the stands is giving a, uh, a standing ovation. I'm thinking to myself, what's so funny that this guy, why are they giving a standing ovation that he slammed my head into the floor? Well, later I watched the game tape and something very special happened. Because I hit my head so hard at half court, I didn't realize it, but my yarmulke fell off. And one of my teammates ran out to half court and he picked it up for me, I was on the sideline the team doctor was fixing the cut over my eye and he slammed the head, he slammed the keep up back on my head for me. And that's why they gave a standing ovation. They respected so much that a non-Jewish athlete would go out of his way in the middle of a division one game to put his keep up back on, uh, put my keep up back on my head. And then two more stories from college. One was against LSU and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We went to play against Louisiana State University and they were very rowdy, making chants about my yarmulke, the student section there. They kept on singing, where did number 22 get that hat from? And then the students would say, the rabbi, the rabbi, the rabbi, the whole game. I never took my yarmulke off. I kept on playing. 
But at the end of the game, when I exited the arena to get back on the bus, the fans, the rowdy fans, they were standing in between the arena and the bus. They wouldn't let me get on the Towson bus. So I said, I don't want to start anything with these guys. You know, they're already making fun of me. I'm just going to try to sprint on the bus. I try to sprint on the bus and they lock, they, they block me. They won't let me get on the bus. I got nervous for a second. What do these guys want? So the guy who was leading the chance, I recognized him from the arena. He sticks his hand out. He says, on behalf of all of us, I just want to shake your hand. I said, shake my hand. You're making fun of me the whole night. Why do you want to shake my hand? He said, because even though we were singing that song about your hat all night, you never took it off. Congratulations. And that's how I got on the bus and we left Louisiana State University. And then finally, 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 we were trying to make it to the big dance, what we call, um, you know, March Madness now this time of year. And we got our schedule. Conference semifinal game came out on a Friday night, biggest game of my life. I made an announcement that I couldn't play. It was featured in all the media outlets in America. But if they would win without me, I'd have a chance to play in the championship on Saturday night, but I only able to play the half second. Abdullah was at halftime. Shabbat ended at halftime. So I, I had to skip the first night. And if we won and they'd advance, I don't want to play half the, half the game the second night on Saturday night. But if they lost on Friday night, the season was over. So I did a little bit of research and I found out that there was a hotel right across the street from the arena. And the team hotel was a 20 minute bus ride away. So I said, coach, I know this is chutzpah, this is crazy, but can you let me stay by myself in the hotel across from the arena instead of staying with the team? That way on Friday night without turning on the TV or whatever it is, I see our fans are happy. I'll see you on Saturday night in the second half. I know we won. If our fans look sad in the parking lot, I'll somehow get a ride home on Saturday night and back to Maryland. Can you give me permission to book the hotel, separate hotel than the rest of the team? He says, go ahead, book the, book the hotel. Unbelievable, unprecedented to leave a team before a night like that, a game like that. So I called up my father and I told him what happened. My father said to me, you know what? I'm so tired of you being by yourself for Shabbos in these remote places. I'm going to shut my office down and I'm going to meet you out there at that hotel and we're going to have Shabbos together. So Friday afternoon, I'm, I'm waiting outside the hotel. I'm waiting for my dad. It's almost Shabbos. Finally, a taxi pulls up and my father gets out. I was so excited. I give him a hug and a kiss. I, was, I, I missed him. He brings all the kosher food and we go into the room. It's almost Shabbos. We do a little, you know, Friday night prayer and we're just about to make Kiddush. And um, all of a sudden we hear a knock on the door of the hotel room Friday night. So I thought to my father, maybe there's another Jewish person at, at the tournament. I don't know, fam. Let's invite him in for some from challah. Great. We both have fish, something. We'll have Shabbos. I went to open up the door, my friends, and I was completely shocked to see that it wasn't another Jewish person looking for a Shabbos meal. It was my entire team. They stopped the team bus on the way back to their hotel. And they said, Tamir, we just want to let you know that we won the game for you and we won the game for Shabbos. We respect so much that you didn't play in the biggest game of your life. And we had to let you know that. And, and that's how I had a chance to play in the second half. Um, I... Second, second half on Saturday night, we lost. I won the coach's award. They told me they were going to build a team around me going into my sophomore year. But unfortunately, during spring break, for a reason I still don't know until today, they fired my coach who helped me with Shabbos. And they brought in another coach who made it absolutely impossible for me to stay there as a Jewish athlete. After months of verbal abuse and me warning uh, the staff at Towson that I was scared and something was wrong from the new coach and they did not listen to me, the new coach tried to slam a chair over my head in the locker room at point blank range. And then he kicked it into me, busted my leg open. And it just happened to be a miracle that there were police officers outside the locker room. Uh, they brought me to the police station and I never played another game of college basketball in my life. But, I've, and I was broken, I'm terribly broken, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But one day I picked myself up. And I said, I can't let someone else take me away from my mission in this world. Hashem gave me basketball to do good. And I can't let someone take that away from me. So I picked myself up and I got myself back in shape. And I got a phone call from Israel, from Maccabi Tel Aviv, from coach David Blatt, very famous coach. He was the first Israeli to coach in the NBA. And coach Blatt said, we read about you in the paper. What do you think about coming over here to Israel to turn pro? I said, coach, nothing will make me happier. So he said, I'm gonna meet you in New York for our tryout. He came to New York, I came up from Maryland. And after one tryout, I signed a three-year contract to play 
professionally for Maccabi Tel Aviv. I came over to Israel and I moved in with my grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor. She was my hero, my best friend. Today's her yard site, her second yard site. Um, so I dedicate this talk to her. She raised me um, and I always wanted to honor her. So I came to Israel and I uh, very soon after I came here, I got a phone call from national service. These volunteers in the hospital, they wanted to invite me to the hospital to meet kids that, that were looking forward to meeting me. And I said, sure, I'd love to come to the hospital. So one of the ladies that was arranging it, she said, um, do you mind if I bring my friend? I said, no. She brings her friend. Her friend tells me, you know, I'm originally from Cleveland. I just made Aliyah. I'm very similar to you. I said, yeah, why'd you make Aliyah? She said, because I had all these um, athletic scholarship opportunities in America to play division one sports, but they wanted me to compete on Chavez. So I told them I, I can't play on Chavez. I gave them the scholarships back. So I'm here in Israel studying and volunteering. I said, you know what? We have the same story. Is there any way we could get married? And she said, yeah. So thank God, two weeks later, we got engaged. And uh, now we have five kids. And that's how I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> After I got married, um, I went into the Israeli army. I wanted to honor my grandmother, like I said, who was a, um, uh, a Holocaust survivor. I wanted to serve in the army for her. And I, um, I was actually awarded the Chayal Mitzdayen. I was awarded the outstanding soldier in my, in my unit for specializing in armor personnel carrier, which was a small tank. After I finished my army duty, I told my wife I want to play again, um, but unfortunately for five years in a row, I got contracts, but every year I suffered a major injury and I was forced to retire um, due to those injuries. After I got hurt, um, I invented a training aid called Zone 190, which is now being used in uh, the NBA. I launched overnight basketball camp here in Jerusalem. Every year I host Jewish players from around the world with NBA players and NBA coaches in Jerusalem. Literally Jewish players from New York, California, Australia, Germany, Austria, they come to train with me every summer. Um, I'm the head of a nonprofit organization called Hoops for Kids, which provides after-school basketball and mentorship programs for underprivileged kids in Israel. So we have programming throughout Israel, kids that are in residential homes, kids. There's 5,000 asylum seekers that are in Israel now from uh, Sudan that came to seek a better life. We do programming for all sorts of underprivileged kids. And I do a lot of scouting for NBA teams. I'm a consultant for La Paul Jerusalem. That's the team here in Jerusalem. And um, I'm about to release Bezrat Hashem, a new, a new product that I just invented. And a movie's coming about, out about me soon. And I also help Israelis with the sports technology that they're inventing here. So I feel very blessed that I got to live out my dream on the court and get to raise my wife, get to be with my wife and five kids here in Jerusalem, that my kids get to grow up in Israel. And I'm forever grateful to Hashem and everyone in my life that helped me uh, live out my dream. So, um, which includes you, because you guys made me really happy to be able to spend time with you today. So I want to give you blessings to everybody and uh, be glad to answer any questions that you have. I also have to give special regards uh, to Richard. I don't know if he's here. I just saw your daughter, Michelle, here in Jerusalem. She told me to make sure to say hi to you. So I'm saying hi. Any, anybody have any questions? I see a lot have been written, but I can't access all of them. Man, so I, Danny, I, I'll, help, I'll help you with, uh, there's some really good questions here. Um, the one I really liked a lot is, did you ever consider uh, playing for Yeshiva or Brandeis, a Jewish, um, a Jewish school? There was a great player named Mitch Kassoff that went to Maryland, but could have been great player at division three so i thought it was a really interesting question and the person wants to know by the way yeshiva is doing really well this year so. yeah i'm very very close with yeshiva university i've trained most of their players because during their gap year i have a relationship with yeshiva university they study in jerusalem before they go to yeshiva university so i train them or many of them ever came to my camp too i'm very very close to yeshiva university i'm super proud of them um when i came here to israel it was during the second intifada and when I was on campus and stuff and they were writing bad things about Israel, it was very much, it hurt me. And I wanted to go help Israel and represent Israel. And after what happened to me, my goal was to show the world you can play division one basketball without playing on Shabbat. I accomplished that goal. And after I did that, and I knew that one day another kid would hopefully be able to use my story to motivate them. 
I felt like it was time for me to move to Israel and, and help Israel as much as possible. And I'm, I'm thankful that I did because I was able to serve in the army, live with my grandmother and also my, my wife. Great, great question. Here's an, another question is, uh, how did the pressure of being labeled the quote unquote Jewish Jordan affect you? Yeah, I never liked the name. I never asked for the name, but the Torah and Judaism always helped me. I never played for myself. I never played, not one time. This kid asked me to come shoot around with him after I retired. I said, you know what? I don't know how to shoot around. I never shot around. Every single time I was on the court, I was getting better for the Jewish people. So that, the Jewish Jordan wasn't about me. It was about something bigger than myself. And that allowed me to handle things much easier during the good times and the bad times. If, if Otherwise, if it would have just gone to my ego, I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have been able to handle the good times and I wouldn't have been able to the bad times. But because it was about the Jewish people, I was an ambassador. I felt like an ambassador. And a lot of times when, when you're an ambassador, you have more motivation than if you were just doing it for yourself. So great. Yeah, this is so inspirational. Everyone is uh, texting me and sending me notes how wonderful this is. And it really is very inspirational to all of us. I have another question here. I don't really understand it, but I think you will. Did you attend the five-star basketball camp? Yes, I did attend Five Star with uh, the legendary uh, Olive Shalom Howard Garfunkel. He was uh, very nice to me. He knew that I was Jewish. Obviously, he was Jewish, but I'm uh, forever grateful for the opportunity to not get only, only invited to play in that in their Invitational Week, but I was actually nominated an All Star in what the, the prestigious it was called the Orange and White Classic. I got I got an opportunity to play in that very special game, and um, that was a moment I'll never forget. We have a question. Are you still in touch with Coach Katz and your teammates from Towson? Yeah, I talk to Coach Katz probably every single day. Um, I'm forever grateful to him. He's he's like a father to me, and he has been since I've been eight years old. Um, and I'm very much in, not only in touch with my teammates from Towson, but every year in Israel, I try to bring either my teammates from Towson or or players, you know, you, you can read about it in today and even the New York Daily News, there's an article about Michael Sweeney, a former NBA player for the Knicks that's coaching at Yeshiva. I brought him here to Israel. He was a dear friend of mine. I brought him here last summer to my camp. I connected him with Yeshiva University. Now he's working at Yeshiva University. I try to bring NBA guys or former teammates of mine to Jerusalem, and then they become ambassadors for Israel as well. Excellent. Uh, I have two questions uh, about this. And uh little touchy, but what's the follow-up story to the, the coach that threw the chair at you? Was he ever fired? Um, he got fired a year later. I moved to Israel and I, I didn't press charges or anything. I, to me, I said, even though it was so hurtful, what clear way is a message from Hashem telling me that it's time to go to Israel? That's how I interpreted it. <laughs> and now when I coach the kids, I'm always extra positive because I never want them, God forbid, to experience what I did, what I went through. And the related question is, did you ever find out why the prior coach, your mentor, why he was actually let go? I never, I don't know, but I'm, I do know that Hashem has blessed him. He got amazing jobs after that, including coaching Michael Jordan's son at UCF. And we're in touch till today. And I love him dearly. And I, I, I am forever grateful to him. That, that's, that's great. So here, here's a question. What's your relationship with Amar Studemeyer and your thoughts on Denny Abdija? So I'm very, I'm, I'm very proud of Amari, and I told him that personally. Um, he's been here in Jerusalem the last three out of four years for the team that I work for. So I think what I told him the last time personally was, in a lot of ways, I'm more proud of what he's doing now than what he did in the NBA because it takes so much courage to do what he's doing. It's not easy. It's not the cool thing to do. And um, I hope that Hashem blesses him and continues to, to lead him uh, to have a happy and meaningful life. Um, Denny, I'm very proud of Denny. Uh, his agent and I are very, very, very close friends. He just got invited to play in a great uh, game this All-Star weekend. And I think that uh, he's going to continue showing the world just how good he is. That's wonderful. So um, I have one. How about the NIT that you're or any of the other postseason tournaments? It sounds like we you never played... We, we, weren't we weren't invited. I basically was only in college one year. Uh, okay. So here's I a did, question. I, did, I saw someone wrote about my 
degree. I did finish my degree. I have a degree in communications and I have a sports consulting business. Here's a good question. You're, friends you're... With, and my friends with Tom Brody and Norman Caspi. Yes, I'm very close friends with both and I love them very, very. <laughs> okay, so you're following along now. Uh, the one about the, they'd like to know about the camp for children with special needs. Tell us a little bit about that. It's not a camp, it's an after school program that after we do school. every single night. We raise money from America um, to support underprivileged kids in Israel. So we have residential homes. Residential homes are homes where their parents are either in jail or the court has, has, has issued that the kids can't go home. It's just not safe for them. So they don't really have athletics at the residential home. So we come in and we build them up through basketball. We give them practice, we give them jersey, we give them a ball. We inspire the kids so that they could break the cycle of negativity in their life. We do this for uh, special <laughs> needs kids, underprivileged kids. And like I said, asylum seekers, we're now opening up our first one for Orthodox girls who never had sport in their life. That's the newest team that we're now opening up in B'nai B'rath actually. So any, any kids that sports can help, we try to, to help them. This organization is called Hoops for Kids. That's, that's wonderful. I'm getting so many emails and texts how inspirational your talk is today. Everyone's giving you big yes, it's, uh, it's really yeah. a great way to start our, for us it's Sunday morning. So for us, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And, and I don't know if you were here in the beginning, but you're reaching, we're three countries, 10 time zones right now. So uh, we're all the way out in California and all the way to uh, to Israel, to where you are right now. So uh, another nice question, were your mentors, to, were you a mentor to any of the Israeli athletes playing at the US college, the Israel Lee Bridge Association? I never heard of that association, but I was very close with many athletes, Israeli athletes that played in America while they were playing and still now. Great. So two really nice questions about you personally. Uh, what sports do your kids play? So we have, we've been blessed with five kids. Um, our oldest is getting ready for the army now. Uh, she's uh, training, not necessarily in sport, but more like uh, conditioning. And she's aiming really high for the IDF. Um, she's being actually recruited pretty heavily. So I think she's gonna have a really good uh, opportunity there, God willing. Um, and then my next, uh, after that, our son, who's going to be 14 soon, he's a very talented basketball player. Uh, and then two girls underneath that that love gymnastics. And then our youngest uh, can't tell yet. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you and your family doing during this pandemic? Are, they, are you still playing basketball? No, nah, basketball has been completely shut down. Uh, we've been able to keep some of the residential homes programming open because they're closed no one could come in and out so that's been good and those kids have needed it more than ever uh, but everything with the pro team's been shut down i'm just hoping that i could still launch camp this summer and um uh, and continue to develop my products very good excellent so i don't understand the question but maybe you do are you friends with duran sheffer very very close friends love him very dearly okay Great, and one, one question. So what can we do to help you? What can we do to help your causes, your tzedakah? Tell us, that's a great question. No, not, nobody needs to do anything. I'm just happy to spend time with you. It's just such an honor to see your faces and get to know you. If anybody wants to help um, Hoops for Kids in any way, you could just email me directly, tamir at tamirgoodman.com. Uh, Danny has all my information. I do. I have this information. So if any one of you, 150 people that are on this call right now, want yeah. to do that, um, feel feel free, um, and um, we would be more than happy to uh, do something in in your honor. So uh, <laughs> here's a good question. It has. To, I don't know the gentleman, but he has to be from the Washington area. Do the Israelis root for the Wizards? Do you, do, are you the Israelis. Uh, root for the Wizards and the Wizards have done a tremendous job uh, of they opened up an Israeli uh, Instagram account Twitter Twitter account where they actually write in Hebrew and update the Israelis in Hebrew on a daily basis here which is fascinating so it's it's a they've done a really nice job excellent excellent oh how <laughs> here's some good questions how tall did you grow to and is your wife as tall <laughs> uh, uh, I'm almost six four my wife is about five five Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
she's a lot taller than me in, in, in every way in this world. She, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have met her. Uh, and here's a nice question. Did you stay in touch and whatever happened to Muhammad? Yeah, Muhammad and I are in touch also almost on a daily basis. Um, uh, yeah, we're very close friends. We love each other dearly. And um, that's awesome. Yeah. That is uh, a that is a, and, and related to that, has your camp promoted Arab Israeli relationships? The hundred percent. Yeah, I do workshops, basketball, anything I could use basketballs to bring people together, unite kids. I do it all the time. I bring every year we bring underprivileged kids to Israel, uh, African American kids that would have never met a Jewish kid in their life. I, I spot, we, we, we raise money, we bring them to Israel. Then they become friends with Jewish kids. And then they go back to their cities and they're like, hey, you guys, you don't know what's up with the Jewish people. You're, you're saying the wrong things here. You know, and I do the same thing with, with, the, with the Arab community. We, I, anything, I can, however I can unite people through basketball, that's one of my biggest missions in this world. That is, that's uh, wonderful. So another question I don't understand, but you probably will. Are you friends with Gal? Mekel, M-E-K-E-L. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have great relationships with everybody in the basketball world, thank God. <laughs> okay, uh, here, let's see. Ah, a couple of good questions. I grew up a mile from you in uh, Pikesville. Do you ever get back to Maryland? Unfortunately, I don't, not that much, but uh, I, I, I miss it. My brothers are, uh, I have family still there. Um, and my father's buried there, so I, I, I want to go. It's been a long time, but hopefully when things get a little better. Excellent. And uh, another really good question. What's your biggest professional challenge right now, currently? Uh, biggest professional challenge currently, um, I would say it's not a challenge. It's a, it's a blessing. Um, but I would say half my day is, is, is for profit. Half my day is nonprofit. And by that, I mean, for every for-profit email I get, it's another email that has to do with tzedakah or helping somebody or connecting somebody. And I, I try to help every single person that contacts me. So trying to, you know, balance all that as well as my wife and five kids, it's just that thing. It's not a challenge. It's, it's, it's a blessing, but I, I just, I want to do well in, in all arenas. That's wonderful. All right, well, we're going to wrap up now. I, I, I think, uh, well, let's just see. Uh, <laughs> uh, please say hello to your wife, Judy, from the Kramer family in Cleveland, especially Lindy Kramer. I will. <laughs> She'll be very happy. <laughs> so um, actually, there's a, you know, we're all connected. And it's actually our, our, we have a virtual convention coming up that this is a paid political advertisement. But our theme is we're all connected. We were supposed to all get together as an organization, uh, but because of the pandemic this summer, we we're still unfortunate to do it. So we're going to do it virtually. And, and our theme is we're, we're all connected. We're, we are still all connected. We're so connected that one of my uh, good friends texted me to remind me that we actually met Tamir at Temple Emmanuel in Newton, Massachusetts, and we spoke at Kiddush. And you're right, I forgot. And he reminded me, so, you know, there's so, so many connections. Um, uh -huh. And we thank you so much for doing this. Hey, um, Danny, you're, you're amazing. And this organization is amazing. And I wish everybody a lot of blessings and success. And thank you for the opportunity. And it's almost Pesach. So we should have a, a Pesach of, of true redemption in every way. Uh, I mean, I mean, Salah. That, yeah, I mean, yashikach. Yashikach to, to that. Yashikach. And thank you, everyone. Tamir, this was just absolutely inspirational. I think all of us, all of us really listened to your story and, and your commitment to Yiddishkeit is, is just overwhelming. It, 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 I mean, you put your money where your mouth is. And for <laughs> someone to, to, to turn down University of Maryland professional because of, of your halacha because of your commitment i think makes us better jews just listening to you um mm -hmm. really 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 uh, a, a special morning for the federation of jewish men's club so and, uh, me spending time with you guys made me a better jew too so thank you everybody and looking forward to being in touch have a decent pace thank you so, guys we'll thank see you uh, thank you tamir thank you we'll see everyone uh, in in a couple of weeks mr kravitz when is it March 23rd, we're going to have uh, Nate Fish 
king of Jewish baseball will be our speaker. Nate Fish, king of Jewish. And Tamir, anytime you want to join us, I'll send you the link. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All thank right, you. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamir. Thank, thank you, Tamir. Oh, well, good, good job. On behalf good of Tom job. Sudo, our president, and Hold everyone down. else, have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you very soon. And thank you, Tamir. Thanks, Danny. Bye. Thank you, guys. Tamir, why don't you come down to South Florida to see Adi? Uh, do, do, you, do you teach Hillel and Mendel? They need a little help in uh, shooting hoops. Yeah, I. I <laughs> I love them. Send them my love and thank you so much. I will. I don't know if you, I, I'm sure you'll know. Adi was on just for a little bit. He's teaching Hebrew school. Oh, Joanne. All right. I, I love him. So, Send him my love. us too. All right. All the best. Stay safe. Thank you. And Bye. 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 for a wonderful program. Absolutely terrific. Great. All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye. You're great. Bye-bye.